Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Berry. I'm the president of Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to a series of four presentations by some of the scientists that are here with us this week for a week-long conference in their field of oceanography, which they will describe better than I, but which has to do with the currents and transport within the ocean. So that's why the title tonight is Go With the Flow. And I'm going to briefly say a couple words about Skudik Institute before turning the floor over. Uh, we are a nonprofit partner to Acadia National Park here at the Skudik Education and Research Center and across the park working with the National Park Service on science, education, and research. Uh, making Acadia National Park a great place for science, facilitating all of the research that is done within Acadia, contributing to projects that are of high priority for the park in their ability to understand and respond to rapid environmental change, and offering a wide variety of opportunities for the public and people of all ages to participate in the scientific process, both for better research outcomes and for the inspirational education experiences that offers. And I hope that if you are not familiar with us or are not already connected with Skudik Institute, you will be. Uh, you can go to our website at skudikinstitute.org to see all of the upcoming programs and events, uh, learn about the work that's underway here and how you can become involved or how you can submit your observations as a citizen scientist to a variety of projects. I also want to acknowledge one of the other groups that's here on campus tonight. We have a team of teen citizen science volunteers that are participating in an Earthwatch project with one of our adjunct faculty, uh, Richard Feldman, if you could raise your hand, Richard. And uh, Hannah Weber in the back is our staff person working with that group. And they are participating in one of these citizen science projects for the week that they are here, contributing as volunteers, uh, doing projects related to climate change here in Acadia, and particularly related to interactions of species and how those interactions may change as the timing of seasonal events changes. So just to mention that group that's here, but every week is different, and there's a huge array of programs that happen over the course of the year and a lot of opportunities to participate in workshops and events here at Skudik Institute. We also are excited to offer public programming like this that brings intellectual activity to the Skudik Peninsula and opportunities for our community members uh, to engage with one another and with our visiting guests. And our lead speaker tonight is Dr. Joe LaCase. He's an internationally known scientist in his field. He's currently a professor in Norway at the University of Oslo. His career has brought him through uh, Woods Hole, where he remains an adjunct scientist, and uh, Virginia and France. He has a PhD from MIT, a master's degree from Johns Hopkins, an undergrad degree from Bowdoin here in Maine, and perhaps most unusual for a scientist with his resume, a diploma from Ellsworth High School. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Joe is also a local boy, and we're glad to have him back, and I had the pleasure of meeting Joe uh, soon after I arrived here last summer, and he had the idea that perhaps he could bring this conference to Skudik Institute as a chance to share this place with his colleagues and a chance to do something positive for the Institute and for this community. And so, Joe, it's wonderful that this has come to fruition and that you are all here. I hope you're having a fantastic experience, and of course you still have a few days left with us. So with that, I will turn the mic and the floor over to Joe LaCase. Okay, okay. Right, let's see. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm in Las Vegas whenever I hold the microphone. Um, all right, all right so, 
So what I'm going to do is, we're, I'm, the, what we're doing with this talk is I'll give a short introduction. I tend to run on, so maybe it won't be so short, but, but it, in, in principle it should be short. Um, and then I will introduce three people who are here at the conference doing different sorts of things, which are the types of things that we're doing at this conference, just to give you an idea. Okay. Um, the title of, of this talk is Go With The Flow. It wasn't actually my idea, but it's a great title anyway. Go With The Flow, Studying Transport in the Ocean. Uh, and so, and these are the three speakers who will be following me. Now, we, this something, if you study transport in the ocean, you, you, it's this constant source of confusion, right? You know, you say, okay, I study transport in the ocean or the atmosphere, and most people think, well, it's a cargo ship or it's an airplane, right? That's transport. Um, but in fact, actually what we're doing is we're studying something a bit different. So this is a, this is a more typical example. Um, this is the one that all my students in Norway love to hear me pronounce. This was the uh, volcano on Iceland, uh, which I call Aya uh, <laughs> which is definitely not how you say it. So, but, you know, so don't say that to anyone from Iceland. But back in 2010, there was a big volcanic eruption, and the ash from that volcano went up, uh, and then it was swept along by the winds. Okay? And this, this totally knocked out the European uh, airspace, uh, because when, when you have these type of particles in the air, this will shut down an airplane engine. Right? So people, for instance, at the Norwegian Center for, for Air Research were doing real-time forecasts of where this stuff was going, uh, and uh, saying this to people, and then, then they made you know, appropriate adjustments. There was a friend of mine who was in London, uh, and she wondered if she should fly to Edinburgh. I checked one of these maps, and I said, don't fly, take the train. She did. And she was the only one who made it to her conference. Everyone else was sitting in London. But anyway, that's an example of transport in the atmosphere. Uh, another one uh, was, a lot of these are disasters, but it's not you know, supposed to be like that necessarily. But they're the colorful ones anyway. This was the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster in Japan. Uh, and this one is, at least from our perspective, was sort of interesting because it's a transport problem in the atmosphere and in the ocean, all right? Because you had the uh, ash going up, which was radioactive, so you had a radioactive plume, and then that was swept along. So the same group that was doing the volcanic simulations were also doing these, and this is plumes of radioactive dust being swept along. Same thing happened in Chernobyl. That was another example of a transport event. Um, but that stuff also leached into the ocean. So you know you had all this water pouring in. They were trying to put out the fires. That water ran off and into the ocean. So you can actually go out and measure, at that time, you could go out and measure uh, radioactive stuff in the ocean, too. So that, what's happening in both these cases is that the winds in the atmosphere or the currents in the ocean are sweeping along something, in this case radioactive something, uh, and taking it somewhere else. And that's, that's what we mean by transport. Um, 2010 was a, was a uh, great year for transport, a bad year if you are concerned about pollution. Here's another disaster. Uh, this is our third speaker is going to talk more about this one. Uh, this was when the Deepwater Horizon, uh, the, the British Petroleum oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico uh, blew up. Uh, that's it up in the upper left corner. And this is a picture from a satellite of that oil slick. So this is an oceanic case. I don't remember if anyone was really that interested in where the smoke was going, but the oil was a big problem, right? Because the oil was swept along and then it was, and, I mean, this always happens when you have big oil spills and so it coated the marine life and it uh, decimated the uh, shellfish industry and on and on. So, um, so from our point of view, we're interested in trying to figure out where this stuff goes, and how it spreads out, and all the details of that. OK. But there's, there's more to it than this. So I promised her I wouldn't say this. But my mother was saying, well, what's your conference about, climate change? <laughs> and in a way, it is, OK? So why? Because. In the ocean, uh, a, big, a big thing in the ocean is, all, is temperature, right? So, and, and heat, and how the temperature moves around, how it gets, how it gets carried along by the currents and relocated. That affects the, the weather pattern. So for example, the last two winters have been anomalously warm in the Eastern Pacific. You have big, warm areas, and that impacted the weather. So we think that's why the weather was so awful here in New England this past winter, I mean, those of you who were here for that, whatever it was, 140 inches of snow, uh, you know about that. But that's probably, rela it's related to this oceanic heat, and that's transported also by the currents. 
if you're a biologist, you're interested in plankton and you're interested in, for instance, lobster. Our second speaker is going to be talking about things that are related to that. This is a picture off of northern Norway. So this is the Barents Sea. And that blue color is, is uh, uh, phytoplankton. So that's being swept along by the currents. And from our point of view, it has all this cool structure, right? All these wiggles and, and things like that. And so that's what we are really interested in studying. Um, but there are other examples as well. Uh, you may have heard, this has kind of become a, a big topic, that you may have heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Okay, this is a, I don't know how many of you have heard of that. Uh, but this is a region in the, in the North Pacific, in the middle of this gyre, where you have a big uh, collection of, of plastic. Okay, it sounds like if you were to go out there, you'd find lots of bottles and things floating around. In fact, you don't. Uh, what it is, is it's degraded plastic, so it's plastic particles. Uh, and not that many, sort of four particles per cubic meter or something. But nevertheless, it's enough so that it can be taken up by the fish and then eaten, and then eventually we eat it as well. So we get plastic fish. Um, where that stuff goes is another transport issue. And so, and that's one that people have become very interested in recent years. Um, we have other people at the conference that are doing this, doing search and rescue. Okay, somebody falls off a boat, right? And then, and for instance, in the middle of the night, uh, and then 12 hours later, they realize, whoops, this person didn't show up for breakfast. Uh, then, then you have a search and rescue problem because you have to figure out where that person went. So what you do is you, you run a model and you try and figure out how that person would be swept along by the currents and then you go looking for that person. So that's a transport problem as well. So there's lots and lots of applications like this. Okay, now, there are, but there are other reasons why we do this. Um, so, if you, so we're oceanographers primarily, okay? And oceanographers have, you know, so we're, we're sort of, in some ways, we're sort of the poor cousins of the meteorologists. Meteorologists get all the attention, right? They get to be on television giving, you know, forecasts. We don't, you know, we don't have those fancy ties and go, hey, you know. so <laughs> these guys do. And, and more than that, they're really, they're spoiled for data, okay? This is a picture of all the weather, so that's a weather station up there in the corner. And this is a map of all the weather stations in, in the United States, okay? All the positions of the weather, right? And I mean, look at all that. It's fantastic, right? There's, how can they get the weather forecast wrong when they have that much data, <laughs> right? It's amazing, right? So how, what's the situation, the corresponding situation in the ocean? Well, it looks more like this, okay? The way that, ocean, that the oceans were studied for many, many, for decades was via ships. Okay, and what you would do is you get in the ship and you would make a, a cross and you would measure as you went. Okay, so this was a big program that was done in the 1990s, it's the World Ocean Circulation Experiment. Uh, I was on one of these, I was on P10. Okay, uh, somebody, <laughs> somebody at Woods Hole put up a sign, they said, wanted student to go from Fiji to Japan. I volunteered immediately. I didn't know what it was for, but I volunteered. I thought, I want to go see what Fiji looks like. So I was on P10. That took, okay, that little P10 over there took 40 days, okay? And I, it was boring, it was so boring, because every 10 kilometers or so, we'd stop, we'd lower the thing down to the bottom of the ocean, we'd pull it back up again. My wife thinks this, she's an oceanographer too. She loves this kind of stuff, so, but you know. But after you do it, you know, five, 10 times, you know, you, I got it, okay, you know, it's kind of, you know, it gets a little boring. Anyway, this took, right, a decade or more, maybe 15 years, 20 years, to cover all of that. Okay, and that's, that's one picture of the ocean, right? And that's, that's all you've got. So, so for many years, that's, that's what we did, and we didn't, couldn't do any better. Okay, but things have changed. Now, we have, there are two different types of things that are going on. One is that we are, people are deploying floats, and they're, deploy, they're also deploying drifters. Okay, there was a friend of mine at Woods Hole who was very skeptical about these things. He used to say, Drifters and floats. The difference between drifters and floats is that drifters float and floats sink. Okay. <laughs> Amy, Amy knew him too, so yeah, I know. You know, you know it's the kind of thing he would say, right? You know. Okay. A float. So this is a float over here. What you do with a float is you dump it in the ocean. It sinks down to a certain level, and then it's swept along by the currents. This particular type of float, it's called an Argo float, pops up. So every week or so it pops up and it takes a measurement. So now we've gone from a situation where we had this slow boat to China. Well, now we have, in this case, this was, I got this map about a week ago, 3,881 floats all over the globe, profiling up and down, getting, getting, uh, getting oceanic data. 
So that's fantastic. Then we also have at the surface, this is the surface drifter, this is the one that's floating, uh, we have about, what's this, about 2,000 of these also spread out over the globe, giving us information all the time about what's happening in the ocean. So things have really changed. Okay, the difference though, is opposed to those chips, is that this is what kind of, this is the, what the data looks like, okay? The, the, catch, the catch with these floats and these drifters is, of course, they don't sit still. It's, it's a little, you can think of it as a little weather station, but it's not sitting still, right? It's being swept along. So the thing is, what do you do with data that looks like that, okay? That is called a spaghetti diagram, all right? <laughs> for obvious reasons, right? And, and, and for many years, that's what people did. They put up a spaghetti diagram and they said, that's what the ocean is doing. Well, okay, it's pretty complex, okay? So what, what a lot of us are interested in doing is figuring out how to tease out information when you have that kind of data, okay? This is another example, this is one of our group that's here, made a picture of the drifters. That's the drifter view of the Caribbean. So if you know the Caribbean, then th those are the drifters moving through there. And there's, there's lots and lots of information. You just have to figure out what it means. Okay. So anyway, this group is called LAPCOD. Um, this is a picture from the last LAPCOD meeting, LAPCOD 5. I don't have a picture from this one because we've been having too much rain. <laughs> um, and so I haven't managed to get a picture yet. But anyway, this is from the last one, which was in Miami Beach, and was organized by Arthur over here. Um, and give you an idea of the group, these people come from all over the place. So this really is an international group. We have, we have Americans, but we also have French, Italians, uh, Turks, <laughs> we have Scandinavians, uh, yes, you know, Swedes. We have, the, we have a whole range of uh, people that are here, and all interested in this topic. So it's great fun because we have, uh, you know, this is the common language is, is talking about this. Now this is the title at LAPCOG, what does that mean? Lagrangian analysis and prediction of coastal and ocean dynamics. Most of that you get, right? Uh, the analysis, prediction, all that. What's that first word though, this Lagrangian thing, what is that? L uh, just so you know, in case anyone ever asks you, this is what it means. Lagrangian comes from a guy, Lagrange, who was a French mathematician, okay? Uh, and when we talk about studying uh, the ocean or the atmosphere, there's two ways of doing it. One is the Eulerian approach, that's after another mathematician, this guy Euler, and that's when you make a grid, okay, and you set at that one point, and you say, for instance, how the temperature or the pressure is changing at that point. The other one, this is what we do, we drift, okay, we wander, all right? And so you're taking measurements, but you're not sitting in a fixed place, and that's the Lagrangian view after Lagrange, uh, this mathematician. Okay, so now you know what that is. Okay, there's a very colorful history behind this, and I'm not going to go into it, but our first speaker is going to give us a little background into this. Um, there's all sorts of stories. Uh, a great, for instance, one of the great early experiments was done with, a, with pairs of parsnips that were tossed into a lake in Scotland by those two guys, Lewis Fry Richardson and Henry Stommel, one of the great, the great meteorologists of all time and one of the great oceanographers of all time. So, you know, there's all sorts of stories. This is John Swallow, who did some of the first floats that Tom is going to talk about. You can see him with his cat uh, putting together a float up there and then following the floats with a ship. So, I mean, it's, it's a very colorful thing. Okay. Um, anyway, so, like I said, I've gone on too long. Um, let me introduce, so, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Tom Rosby. He's from the University of Rhode Island, and he does float experiments. After that, we'll hear from Jim Manning, who's from a NOAA lab, and he's going to talk about using drifters for instance, to study how lobster, lobster moves and so forth. And our final speaker would be Tamai Oskokman. He's going to talk about the deep water horizon oil spill and about the studies that have come from that. So I'll hand this over to you, Tom. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, Joe, wherever you are, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, um, <clears throat> I'm an engineer by background, and so some of the slides are going to talk about the various subsurface floats, not drifters, subsurface floats that drift. They don't sink, they drift. But before I get started, I'd like to give you just a little bit of uh, one slide background. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is a picture from a uh, book by Sverdrup. Uh, published in 1942, Sverdrup and a couple of other authors, 
showing the North Atlantic circulation uh, as they knew it in the uh, early uh, 40s. Um, it's actually a pretty good picture. We might consider it dated today. Some numbers have changed and so forth. But it's it, by, at the scale, at the, at the level of detail that that picture gives you, it's actually a pretty good picture even today. Uh, the way that picture was constructed, though, was by earlier versions of what Joe mentioned about these long lines of what we call hydrographic sections, where we lower instruments on a wire to get temperature and salt and oxygen at various depths. It was a very laborious task. <clears throat> and there was no point in taking these profiles very densely uh, because the ocean, from the perspective of those measurements, didn't change that very much. So they were rather far apart. And what that means is that they, uh, they, the picture as a whole is pretty cool. Uh, oh, thank you, Cecilia. Thank you. As a whole, it's, it's quite accurate. But it doesn't give you any detail at all about the machinery of the ocean, what makes it tick, how things communicate, how things go around. Uh, the, the analogy with machinery is not totally mistaken uh, or out of order. If you think of uh, going into a factory with a machine shop, and you have belts that drive the various machines from a central motor, uh, you have various machinery like lays and, and drills that spin around. Uh, they will correspond to the eddies that you will see in a moment. The, the straps or the, <clears throat> the belts would be something like the fronts that we have in the ocean. And then we can talk about um, uh, how the ocean has friction in it. That would be the equivalent of grease in the ocean to keep things running smoothly. That may be pushing the analogy a little bit, but the point is that with this kind of picture, Informative though it is, tells us very, very little about the mechanics of the ocean, the machinery, how it actually works, how it communicates with itself. So this is the picture that Joe showed. This is a very famous picture. It's quoted up and down and left and right. It shows John Swallow uh, with his first swallow float um, <clears throat> from about 1954, and that float uh, was ballasted to, uh, its weight was adjusted to float at a certain depth in the ocean. Um, it wasn't an easy thing to do then, and actually it still isn't a very easy thing to do, um, to target the float to get it to be on a certain, at a certain depth or on a density surface. But that float could be, it emitted short pings, it went ping, 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 every so often. And you'd hear those p uh, pings in a couple of hydrophones in the ship, and by uh, looking at the time of arrivals, you could figure out where that float was. So as it drifted, the ship followed. And um, a lot of excellent science was done in the early days with this technology, the swallow float, as it was called. And generically, all of these instruments are called swallow floats. Uh, <clears throat> but it was costly in that we had to use a ship to track the floats. So uh, Henry Stommel, actually, for some years, uh, who is the dean of American oceanography, if not global ocean, physical oceanography, um, had this vision of using the deep sound channel uh, in the ocean to track floats over great distances using land-based hydrophones, hydrophones in the water that come off the shore. <clears throat> and the basis for that was this discovery during World War II, which was, of course, extremely classified in those days, what's called this deep sound channel or so far channel, and it, it has, the essence of it is that there's an acoustic sound velocity minimum at certain depth, which is associated with the temperature gradient, the cooling at the, near the surface, and the increasing pressure at depth. That leads to a sound velocity minimum such that any sound that's emitted near that sound source minimum, sound source on the left there, that sound will always be refracted back towards the sound channel axis. And that means the sound is going to spread out cylindrically instead of spreading out in all directions. So you lose the energy of that signal much, much more slowly with that cylindrical rather than spherical spread. <clears throat> so that was uh, Stalmo's dream. And I can tell you some stories about that, but I don't have time for that this evening, um, unfortunately. But he, anyways, got uh, Doug Webb in the lower left picture with a hard hat. The guy without the hard hat is me. Uh, <clears throat> In those days, I still had some hair, and it was pretty long. But uh, <clears throat> Doug was an incredible, is an incredible engineer, by the way. 
Um, he developed uh, those three floats on the top. The original one up on the left and then uh, the uh, one in the middle and the right was used in some major field experiments in the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> then in the early 80s, um, I picked up the trail a little bit and we started developing uh, what's called the Rafos float, the words so far spelled backwards. And uh, here, uh, the floats don't transmit acoustic signals the way the ones on top do. Uh, these floats on the bottom two uh, pictures, they listen for acoustic signals from fixed uh, sound sources. Uh, and <clears throat> that had the advantage that the size of the float came way down and uh, the cost of the system as well. Uh, here's a nice picture of Phil Richardson, who I think is hiding here in the room somewhere, uh, <clears throat> holding a Rafos float, as they're called. At the bottom end of the instrument is what's called a hydrophone that listens for the acoustic signals, measures pressure to know its depth and the temperature of the water that it's in. The floats are tracked acoustically. We put out sound sources. There's a, a, a modern sound source on the left. Uh, and it's just an open pipe that resonates thanks to a device inside it that uh, makes it resonate. <clears throat> and it trans a signal that looks like that red line up there. That's an 80 second long signal that changes frequency very gradually. And I was going to give you a recording, but it takes 80 seconds, so that's a little too long. But basically, <clears throat> it just sounds like a foghorn that's stuck on for 80 seconds. And it gradually changes its frequency, as that line indicates. And so it's a signal with a very, very specific shape, frequency content. And the float listens to exactly that signal and nothing else, and can detect those signals uh, depending on the acoustic environment, the sound channel, and hear those signals at thousand kilometer distances. We don't typically work that great a distance, but that's, <clears throat> and we can navigate these things. And then you have three sound sources or more like in the figure here. And from the time of arrival from those sound sources, we can get the position of that subsurface float as it moves along <clears throat> two, three times a day. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of experiments that we did. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, one from the uh, late 70s using that long Hope, uh, so far float over there. And this shows a cluster of 10 floats that are moving back and forth in the region between Bermuda and Cape Hatteras. And they're executing what's called a planetary wave motion. And uh, <clears throat> I can't really go into this in great detail, but this is the same group of floats, but after taking out the, the translation of the group of floats. And what is really beautiful about this is when that group of floats moves north and the Earth's rotation is felt more strongly, the floats start rotating or spinning in the opposite direction. And then as they move to the south and feel the, rota the Earth's rotation less, they start uh, spinning in the opposite direction. <clears throat> it's, called planetary, it's called conservation of angular momentum um, <clears throat> or absolute vorticity. Uh, the uh, postdoc who worked on this, Jim Price, showed that it helps also to take into account water depth. Another very nice record. Uh, well, we hadn't seen that type of stuff before, so it was pretty exciting when we saw that at the time. And, um, if I may sound excited about the work that I have done in the past, I, uh, I think that's fair enough. But I will also say this, that uh, listening to the talks here at this meeting today, the science is every bit as exciting today as it was then, if not more so. <clears throat> so this is another experiment with the big SOFAR float uh, looking at uh, spinning lenses in the eastern Atlantic, what we call medis. And um, this is another example of very conspicuous machinery or structure in the ocean. This SOFAR float was put in that eddy. We knew about it when we put it in. And we hoped that it would stay in the eddy so that we could find that eddy or lens or medi again a year later, and it worked. So we tracked that float uh, with listening stations, and we drove uh, the people who were doing the experiment, Phil Richardson and Larry Army, they could just drive right back up to the, um, <clears throat> the lens and study that eddy a year and even two and three years later. So that was pretty, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you have this body of water 
And water stays trapped in that for a couple of years. And we now since then have records of, of lenses trapping water for many years. <clears throat> Another example uh, came a little later in the 80s is when uh, Amy Bauer and I started putting out floats, isopycnal floats, floats floating on a temperature surface, regardless of depth, uh, in the Gulf Stream. And depending on the temperature surface that the floats were put on, the floats would scatter different distances downstream. So we have learned an awful lot about the structure of the Gulf Stream. And that work <clears throat> led to a paper by Amy Bauer, which uh, has had an enormous impact on how we think about the structure of uh, ocean, uh, eddy motions in the ocean. Um, this is a, uh, another <clears throat> paper done by a British student who was visiting Amy, uh, just showing that uh, something like 16% of the time that floats were drifting around in the ocean, Mephos floats, the glass pipe floats, uh, something like 16% of the time these floats were trapped in these coherent eddies, spinning around in eddies. So these eddies are common. That was one of the big messages. <clears throat> so the, these are eddies that are spinning anti-clockwise. The previous one was clockwise. And they're about as many of, of both kinds. This is a fantastic movie that I can't, I tried to download, but I couldn't. But um, this is a fantastic movie that Amy and Heather Fury showed this morning of their work with floats in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> I think you can download it, although I didn't succeed today. Um, but if you just remember either Amy Bauer or Hidden Currents in the Gulf of Mexico with dashes in between, just go to that website. Google that, Hidden Currents in the Gulf of Mexico, and you'll find this. It's an incredible uh, thing to see. <clears throat> OK, now I'm going to wind up. Um, we have been doing this kind of stuff for the better part of 40 years. Um, there has been interest in being able to track fish using this same acoustic technology, the vapors flow technology. So starting a little over 10 years ago, uh, Gody Fisher at URI <clears throat> got a grant to develop uh, a, a complete receiver that's on a piece of silicon. And that's this left picture there. That's about one and a half millimeters square. And that square has, and it's a functioning, it's, it's working now, uh, that has a complete acoustic receiver for the vapor signal, as well as pressure and temperature measurements. And that chip goes inside that cylinder there, uh, which is about an inch long, or four-tenths of an inch wide. <clears throat> and that can be then put on uh, fish, uh, what's called an archival fish tag. Uh, these archival fish tags are used a lot by the, uh, <clears throat> the fishery scientists. Uh, but they typically measure temperature and pressure, perhaps light. Uh, this will be the first time that we'll actually be able to track fish acoustically. Uh, so that's a pretty exciting uh, <clears throat> step forward. Uh, Amy and Gody Fisher have also gotten a grant from the National Science Foundation to port that technology into a next generation rapos float that will be smaller, uh, maybe somewhere on the order of one yard or a yard and a half long. We don't want to make them too small, these floats, because they, then they run the risk of being eaten up, and we, we'd rather not do that. We, I mean, we don't want... I didn't say this, by the way, but these floats are recording data as they drift, and at the end of their mission, they come up to the surface, and they telemeter their data back to a satellite. So that's... Uh, so this is the scenario that we have for the future. Uh, one thing that we'd like very much to be able to do is to have the floats drift very close to the bottom. This is one thing we can't do today very well, and have what's called an acoustic altimeter to see where it is above the bottom, and then adjust its buoyancies to float and keep that distance about the same as a function of time. But that same fish chip, in addition to going on to the buoyancy, uh, the next generation reefless float could be put on codfish, and thanks to Jim Manning this morning, it occurred to me, well, maybe I can put them on lobster as well. Um, <clears throat> I was reminded at dinner, though, that lobster molt, and that uh, introduces a slight problem. <clears throat> but I think if there is a will, there's a way to solve that problem. <clears throat> Actually, I'm quite convinced of that. So I'd like to finish this by saying that 
acoustically vapor, acoustically tracked vapors floats are revealing to us the amazing machinery of the ocean, such as coherent eddies, planetary wave motion, and flow along fronts. And they were, I didn't discuss this, but they're also very effective for studying um, uh, pathways of dispersion, mix, mixing, and even convection. <clears throat> and that's kind of my slogan there. Uh, the beauty of floats is that they listen to the ocean in its own language. Thank you very much. Back this past March, I was invited up to a church basement in uh, Rockland, down the coast here. I, I don't know what kind of church it was, but it was a, had a big room. It was the biggest room in the town, I guess, so we could uh, build some drifters. There was uh, several high schools, down east high schools represented, t teachers and students. They were uh, funded by a Penobscot East Resource Center. Uh, they have a program called Eastern Maine Skippers Program, where they try to get uh, some high schoolers interested in uh, something other than lobsters. And uh, we, we, we spent the day building these rigs here out of materials that we, we got at the local hardware store. This little transmitter is lashed on top. It gives its position to the satellite. So we've been doing this quite a bit in the last decade or so at different places along the New England coast. Just so happens I've been working down east here uh, in recent months. Uh, Narraguegas High School and uh, Jonesport Beals, Rhinel Haven, Deer Island. We all have drifters and they're helping us out uh, to monitor the flow along the coast of Maine. Um, this is one example of, of many in the last decade, from, uh, mostly New England, tracking uh, the coastal current. Here's, you can't read, this is a, a slogan here. We drift, meander, and disperse. We don't know where we're going. We're studentdrifters.org. And uh, probably 80 schools uh, have, have been uh, exposed to the drifter in some way and are helping uh, build them. Um, we typically have these kinds of workshops a couple times a year um, along the coast where, where teachers come and they each t come, go home to school with a drifter. And they also learn a little bit about how, what to do with the data. So I'm going to... Uh, that was just a brief description of the project. I'm going to go into two applications of why we, why we do this. One is lobsters and the other is Halmphalaga blooms. I first uh, got involved with this uh, my first time up in, off the coast of Maine uh, on a boat in 2002. Um, I had been working offshore and I came up and I couldn't believe how many uh, uh, lobster lobster gear was there, and I was very interested in the, uh, after a few years, got very interested in the transport. I'm going to talk about that, um, and then followed by uh, another application. This morning, uh, I talked with the colleagues about uh, the um, validating models with these strippers. But I'll focus on these two here now. And you've heard a couple of these other applications that uh, we've had in the last decade. So, I, I, back in uh, oh, almost 15 years ago, I went to a meeting up here in Maine, and there was a lobster biologist talking about the, the variability of uh, the settlement of lobster larvae. When, when the, the female releases the eggs, it, it travels a good, good distance along the, the, the uh, larvae, travel a good halfway down the coast before they settle. In different years, they settle at different places. He was finding all kinds of year-to-year -year differences in where these lobsters settle. And to me, as a physical oceanographer, it was, it was obviously uh, currents that were... were uh, so I, uh, that's uh, got me interested in, in, uh, and moved up uh, and started deploying drifters here with the help of uh, lots of lobstermen. 
Uh, at the time, before I, uh, before that, even back in the 90s, I had uh, I was working with lobstermen out here. Um, I, I was on big research vessels for a while in the 80s and 90s, and I realized there's lots of lobstermen out here. They have traps and they have moorings all over the place, and so we started putting sensors on their traps. Started with simple temperature sensors, internally recording temperature sensors. So now. Uh, on the order of 50 uh, individuals have been recording hourly bottom temperatures for the last uh, 15 years all along the coast of Maine. And, and, uh, and in recent years, we're starting to get real-time uh, data. That is, when, the, when they haul their gear on deck, the temperature wirelessly goes to the wheelhouse and onto the satellite. These lobstermen, there's a whole group of them, Down East Association, Maine lobstermen, they're very interested in oceanography. And um, I see them often. I go to the Maine Fisherman Forum every year. And uh, this is a group of them here. And all along the coast, uh, these are the guys that uh, have been deploying uh, both temperature sensors on their traps and drifters. Some of these guys, uh, Belfast, Bucks Harbor, Tinicus, Cutler. After deploying these drifters, these, you've seen these plots already, spaghetti plots of, of drifters primarily deployed by lobstermen along the various uh, parts of Maine. You might see a little pathway here along the coast we call the Maine Coastal Current that runs around like this. But there's lots of variability from year to year. That's what we're interested in, and not only year to year, but maybe decade to decade. And that's why we're interested in getting the youth involved for the next few decades to keep this going, because there's some variable from changes that might be happening in, the, in, the, in scales of a decade as different waters come down from the north, different slightly fresher or sometimes melt water coming down from the north and changing the circulation within the Gulf. There's some questions about the turnoff here near Penobscot. Does it, does it go off this way or go straight down? There's, there's all kinds of bifurcations along the coast that, that vary year to year. And that will regulate how much Lobster larvae lands um, down mid-coast or uh, southern Maine versus uh, gets washed off. Are some of these, I'll, I'll tell this story of later here at, in the eastern Maine coastal current. But we, we can do the statistics on this each block of the ocean now. We have the mean velocities and the residence times and variability for those pieces of the ocean. And the temperature down below, thanks to these lobstermen, have been now recorded in this case a decade of, of, of it hasn't, he hasn't missed an hour of temperature, bottom temperature. We can compare the observed temperature from the lobster trap with the models. There's various circulation models from different universities around the uh, New England that, that generate these, these, this output. But how good is it? And uh, these. Lobster data are now being fed in. Lobstermen recorded temperatures are now being fed into the model, assimilated to the model to help them do hindcast. And the hope in the future is for their real-time data to help uh, feed the forecast so, that, so the fishermen will be able to, to have a better idea of the bottom temperature changes day to day in the future. So. On to the second application. How, how, how much time we got here? Yeah. Harmful algal blooms. Uh, this is a very similar uh, situation where you have a, a particle that's on the bottom in the mud up here. And it's certain, almost the same time of year that, that uh, toxic cyst or uh, plankton comes to the surface and blooms. And it's very similar to me. Uh, uh, a cyst is the same thing as a lobster larvae. It's a particle that drifts free. And, it, and uh, there's lots of them here in the Bay of the Fundy that, that uh, dial around and, and let go down this coast very quickly. And this time of year especially, the, the blooms happen. And the big question is, uh, if the bloom happens offshore, is it going to come into the flats? Do, do we have to be concerned on the, on the tidal flats? So we're trying to monitor the, the concentrations of these toxic uh, alexandrium uh, plankton. Lots of folks at Woods Hole Oceanographic are, are, are part of this uh, main DMR, uh, the Canadians, a big joint project that's still ongoing and, and probably will continue. 
Um, I, I got an email from, from those, these folks uh, about a week ago asking, you know, any chance you could put a drifter in the East Main Coastal Current? Uh, and the bloom is on. It's 1,000 cells per liter, buoy I, which is just down off the coast here, up to 2,000. So uh, I tried to do this fast response, and then uh, it's not difficult. I mailed a couple of transmitters to the schools up here, and, and the post office was closed on a Saturday, and then they lost the package. So uh, I uh, right, and then I got an email yesterday. Said they're still looking for it today. They found it. So off of uh, Deer Isle Mall, they're going to put out a drifter. In the meantime, I have this one, and I was thinking maybe we could throw out as tomorrow. So I might have two two drifters going in the water. Uh, unfortunately. Things happen fast, and, and uh, we, this is too late now. Uh, the thing, this bloom is gone, and uh, I'm going to show you why. Here is the, the, uh, the vessel went out. Uh, this is July um, of 2015. This, this month, these are stations. Where they, this station right here, right off of Winter Harbor, uh, over 1,300 cells per liter toxic algae um, right there. And this is the ESP, environmental sampling something, uh, mooring, this very high-tech unit that uh, record, re telemeters um, uh, levels of toxic algae uh, um, back on a on near daily basis. And that, that's reporting high levels. So this is prime time to put things out. So Deer Isle will be, uh, where are they, here somewhere? Here. They're going to come out and deploy theirs in this area, and we might put one here. So, why is it too late? Well, back several years ago, I did some calculations on the, on the flow-through time here from the Canadian line down to, what is this, uh, Acadia, or just near Penobscot. This is all the drifters that historically come through this transect right here, flow through pretty quickly, and head down in, in, on an average that only takes a week to go from Canada to Penobscot. So you can see uh, that the bloom that happened here uh, last week is, is probably on its way down. That's the point that uh, the ocean uh, moves, and this is what we're, we're trying to uh, get across with both observations and, uh, and models. Here's the record of that uh, mooring levels of uh, Alexandrium cells from late June to last week, you can see these peaking blooms that occurred um, back here. This is when I got the email that I better get a drifter out there. So next, uh, 2016, we have a program um, to deploy dozens of drifters off of Grand Manan about this, well, starting in uh, May through August. So. Uh, this a big question of how much leaks out of the Bay of Fundy gyre. This is very high levels up there, and how much gets down to the eastern main coastal current. So next summer, uh, you, you might see lots of drifters flowing by here. But it only takes a, uh, a week or so. And if I have time, I'll look at the current situation. I, a quick summary, and uh, uh, just that my, my point is that uh, fishermen have been very helpful, and uh, I, I hope to continue working with them and uh, keep, keep the next generation coming along. Um, and let's, let's look at w what's happening um, right now. Let's see. I can, I'm going to go to the main drifter site. There's all kinds of links, but the first one is what's uh, drifters out there right now. So some of these are deployed long ago, but um, let's zoom in to the Gulf of Maine. These were, these, these, drift, these were all drifters here, deployed by various high schools around New England, probably seven or eight different high schools. And um, this, this one um, came, this is, these tracks, these are the line in the past month. So there's two drifters here. Uh, off of Digby Neck, they were deployed uh, when? Uh, 
3rd of, of July. And this one, that one landed on a rock and, and uh, somebody picked it up in Grand Manan. But this one is due off of Winter Harbor probably in the next few days. That's how quickly it gets down here. Um, and we're going to put out an, uh, another one here and another one here. And each school has their own uh, custom website uh, with all kinds of links to things. And go back, I'll go down to July. Here's one we did last week, for example. We sometimes put different types of drifters. This is a standard, ocean, pretty close to standard oceanographic surface drifters. But sometimes we're interested in near surface, even um, what happens to a surface part. So we put out three different types of drifters last week in Buzzards Bay. And just to demonstrate that how different um, the different types of drifters, even though they're slightly different design, the red and yellow were near surface drifters, and this blue is a deeper drogue drifter. The red one here is just like that one, it quickly came ashore here in, in the Elizabethan Islands off of Woods Hole. And this drogue one is now, I just checked uh, this morning, is down on its way to Long Island. So I think I'll call it quits there. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm Tamay Özgürkman. I'm a professor at the University of Miami, and it's a great facility, and we have been enjoying the location. Uh, I'm going to do something a little different. Um, we made three short movies uh, precisely for an audience like that to uh, transmit our science as efficiently and easily as possible. But I never played these videos in front of an audience like this, so I'm going to try an experiment today. Uh, they are about four minutes each and uh, different aspects of what we do. oil spill in 2010, scientists came together to study how contaminants like oil move from deep water onto our beaches. At first, you might think it's pretty straightforward. If you pour something offshore, like this pink dye, don't worry, it's EPA approved and doesn't hurt the environment, it will just end up on the beach, right? To answer this, a group of scientists from the University of Miami the Naval Postgraduate School and Delft University went to Destin, Florida to conduct an experiment using drones. Here's how it works. First, they place sensors up and down the beach in the area of interest. They measure things like the velocity of the current and the concentration of dye in the water. They also survey the beach using a super accurate GPS so they know exactly where everything is. Next, they release a specific amount of dye offshore from a boat in different patterns. In this video, we're looking at a straight line release parallel to the shoreline. Once the dye is in the water, the first drone is launched and sent out to a specific latitude, longitude, and altitude over the water. Once it's on station, it starts recording high definition photos with its onboard GoPro. Here comes the tricky part. Since the drone's batteries only last for about 10 to 15 minutes, it's impossible to get continuous coverage of how the dye moves. But what if you have two drones? With two drones, when the one in the sky starts running out of juice, the second on the beach can be launched to relieve it. With this configuration, they're able to monitor the dye without missing anything. Add a generator on the beach to charge the old batteries, and they can keep a drone in the sky as long as they want. Pictures from the drones offer a lot of important information about how oil might make its way to the beach. When you add all the photos together in a sped up time lapse video, it becomes clear that this process isn't as simple as we might think. Because the GoPro has a fisheye lens, the images are distorted, making it hard to measure how far and how fast the dye moves. To fix this, the distortion is removed. Then, using what are called ground control points, or points in the picture that we know the GPS position of, 
the image is georectified. A fancy way of saying that it's transformed so that one pixel length represents the same distance in all directions. Georectified images are very valuable. With them, scientists can accurately measure how much the dye spreads, how fast the currents are moving, and much, much more. Not bad for a couple of little robots. To learn more, visit C-A-R-T-H-E dot org. So this is our research group uh, cut. So now I'm going to move to the second part of my talk. <laughs> I can see it. This is a simpler movie, and the last one is probably the most complicated, uh, but it's more to communicate. Meet Bob. Bob is doing well, very well indeed. That's because he's helping the planet. With his specially designed body, Bob drifts with ocean currents and communicates his position and speed back to scientists on shore. Today, Bob is in the Gulf of Mexico. Sometimes, if the conditions are right, he can get stuck in what is known as the loop current. In the loop current, Bob meets larval lobsters from Mexico. The currents may take them through the Straits of Florida, towards the reefs of Florida and the Caribbean where they can grow into legal-sized delicacies. If there's a hurricane, Bob doesn't evacuate, he stays and measures valuable data about the violent surface currents. Thanks, Bob! Bob can help in all kinds of emergencies, including when a pollutant is released into the water. Bob drifts with the yucky stuff in the ocean currents and sends his data to be fed into computer models that help scientists predict its fate. Not only that, but if somebody gets lost at sea, who can help figure out where the ocean currents may take him? Bob can! To track Bob and his friends, and to learn more about what he does, visit C-A-R-T-H-E dot org. So it's not going bad, I think. I've been lazy. All right, so this is our final, final film. When an environmental disaster strikes, before we can respond effectively, we must scientifically understand its complex nature. Catastrophic environmental events often involve extremely complicated subsystems, such as oceanic and atmospheric turbulence, air-sea interaction, and tropical cyclones. What team of researchers and what facilities does it take to tackle such massive scientific challenges and be ahead of the curve when disaster happens again? When the Deepwater Horizon uh, event happened, we quickly realized that this was perhaps the largest and most important oceanographic event in our careers. Oil was not tracked perfectly, there were nice images, but we needed a, actually an extensive collection of observations. So when we got funded by GOMRI with our CART consortium, which comprises of 28 investigators, more than 40 researchers, students and postdocs, 14 institutions, all working together with the objective of understanding how the oil spill happens, how it propagates and disperses, gets transported by the ocean atmosphere and waves, and how we can model that more accurately, we said, why don't we try to reproduce something like this oil spill and measure things very accurately? So we came up with Grand Lagrangian deployment, a GLAD experiment. So we released 317 drifting instruments at the surface of the ocean, deployed by students and with precision uh, GPS uh, instruments within half a meter accuracy to see how fast they expand and where they go. This has been never been done before. It's the largest upper ocean dispersion experiment ever carried out in oceanography. 
we were able to collect something like 5.5 million data points from this experiment over a period of six months to understand how things move at the surface of the ocean. And we can compare it to what we modeled using our state-of-the-art circulation models. We have near-field models, and these models are essentially simulating this turbulent gas and oil plume, how it comes from the pipe. And then we have ocean models that actually get that output and transport in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Then when it gets to the surface of the ocean, things get very complicated because the surface of the ocean is where the ocean interacts with the atmosphere. That's why we have all these waves and storms. And during this experiment, there was also a hurricane, Hurricane Isaac. It passed right over our drifter array. And we collected some incredible data through which we can actually evaluate. So we need to incorporate an atmospheric model to model all these elements. Also, the oil gets transported into the Gulf of Mexico and also towards the shore, towards the Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida. So we have coastal models that actually can handle shallowing uh, topography as well as breaking waves at the surface of the ocean when we get close to the beach. So looking into the future, our main objective is actually to piece these models together and we have, we have a framework for actually getting this oil and gas plume at from the wellhead all the way to where it went. Most of these models are run on tens of thousands of CPUs, generate a lot of data which require a lot of analysis. The problem with this large output is that we need a way to distill it down so that we can grasp it. So this is where our uncertainty quantification techniques come in. These are statistical and highly mathematical techniques that actually allow us to distill the data, the model parameter space, to something that will be helpful ultimately in oil mitigation, you know, where are the dangerous areas, statistically dangerous areas, where it's kind of safer. So something that's practical for people in the field in case another event occurs. The public can rest assured uh, that, that everything has been handled on an independent basis. The scientific community owns this process None of the researchers are beholden to BP and totally capable of publishing their results, whether they favor BP or whether they don't favor BP. We're creating this community of scientists that would not have gotten together otherwise on this scale to tackle problems. And the students that will be there in that environment, because there's going to be a large number of students that will be supported by this program, they'll continue to work together. And their, their commonality is the goal. End of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs>
and there's very little cross bank flow. So it, it's a really strong uh, gyre there. That in the winter time, if I had more winter data, you'd see them blown across the bank, the shallows towards the bank. Hello. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to say that it's been great. Like, I didn't know anything about the sonography, and just is blowing my mind, no? like, to start looking at the maps the other way around and so on. So, yeah, thank you. And then, so, I, yeah, it's also very amazing to see, like, the work with the fishermen and, like, making, like, what uh, they call citizen science for real. So, I have one question for the last presentation. Um, because like the the first thing I say is because I think it's pretty impressive uh, how like scientists can communicate science in such an amazing and powerful way. And so I was wondering what these videos are for, or like what is your audience or who's who who is like the the, the main public you're expecting. And then the, it was interesting to me to see the last one because as a person who doesn't know anything. But then, like, guess this all information. I kind of, it was interesting to see also the, the kind of momentum this uh, video portrays, and then the science, like, with this uh, monumental song and everything. And it's amazing, no? Because oh, you guys do an you, amazing you. job. But then, like, in relation to oil, I also was like, oh my goodness! But I just understood from your work that there's a lot of questions out of this, and so isn't it a bit tricky that maybe the the video shows that there's a lot of certainties, specifically when like oil is spilled, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's a very sensitive and yes. environmental problematic topic, so. Yeah, yeah. certainly this problem opened a, a kind of, a, um, for the longest time, oceanography, physical oceanography were, was about submarine warfare. It was deep ocean, but then when we had the oil spill, we could actually see if we, could succeed in predicting this, and we, I think, failed very dramatically, uh, for persistently throughout the whole oil spill. So we are, you know, we are on our fourth year of research, and we are so far away from understanding what happens in the ocean near the surface of the ocean. And that's definitely, um, we do essentially basic science. Uh, so the kind of science we do is supposed to be not necessarily for oil companies or anything like that, but essentially for the entire physical ocean of community. The videos were initially intended uh, for my mother because, <laughs> <laughs> because I tried to explain this to her over a couple, couple of years and she never quite understood it. And, and finally I said, okay, let me see what else I can do because it's impossible. And so the first video worked very well and the second video worked well and so we kept going. And then we are using it for audience like this. Also for high schools and uh, uh, anywhere we go, really. I mean, I, don't, I never did that before, but we have staff uh, uh, who show these videos and also uh, essentially anybody who is not a scientist, for non-scientists. It should be short, very few minutes, and it should be entertaining, clear, not the kind of language that we, we usually speak. <laughs> uh, uh, something that's not, I mean, if it's, if it's very long, it, people usually do not kind of tune out. So that was the strategy. But we definitely need, the, as, as you've seen, the content comes from our scientific, I mean, it's not like we tell stories. The content comes from our experiments, at sea experiments. So we film them, and then somebody puts the, that together. OK, good. Another question? Yeah. Do you uh, include the study of tsunamis when you're working in transport? And if so, what do they reveal to you? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, who's working on tsunamis? Hmm. I mean, tsunami, so, what a, so basically what a tsunami is, it's a, you know, a fast-moving wave, right? So you have an earthquake, lifts up the ocean, and then you generate a wave, and then the wave comes in and does a lot of damage. Um, usually, is as dramatic and damaging as those are, as far as transport goes, they're not that important because they move so fast, generally. These are very fast moving systems they go through. So they tend to, if you're, I mean, if you're out in the ocean, it's a good place to be if there's a tsunami. You notice that the ocean goes up and it goes down and that's about it. So as far as transport goes, we're not so worried about them. But definitely 
there are oceanographers and who are studying tsunamis uh, for you know for that modeling them too. Yeah. A lot of focus recently uh, um, for modelers is uh, flooding and inundation of the of the coast uh, after storms like Sandy. There's a lot of efforts going in now to to make sure we can uh, model and forecast a, a, a sudden event along the coast that would. As, as you said, this is the beginning of, you know, the long study, because I could think of a billion questions from this, like, for instance, what changes with the debt, the depth of the, uh, whatever you're, you're tracking, and does it change with the temperature, does it change with particles that it rubs up against, and how, I, I, I could go on and on. So, what is the next step to get to that place where we really understand not just where it floats, but you know what happens to it and how that affects long term? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. I know when I was when I was studying. Okay. I I took a course on chaos. All right. My father said to me, "Ah, oh, you're taking a course on chaos. Yeah. Do you like that course?" And I said, "Yeah, I like it. It's really interesting." Do you find that course suits you? And I said, yeah, it does. So you find, okay, okay, I get it. You know, it was, uh, this is uh, what happens, trajectories, so you hear about the weather being chaotic, being difficult to predict, right? We can, if we're lucky, we predict the weather three or four days from now, but predicting the weather two weeks from now is almost impossible, okay? Uh, these type of things, when you're, when you're talking about trajectories, they're even more chaotic than the weather. So that means you can have very simple, flows, tidal flows, for example, which we can predict. We can predict the tides 50 years in advance, right? But how particles are going to move in the tides, we can't predict because it's because of this chaos that's in the system. So we're, what we're doing, this is what I mean when I show that picture, these spaghetti plots, that's, that's the chaos, right? That's this unpredictability. And that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating. Like all of us, like what, what Tom was saying, when we, sh when we sh see these things, we just, love it. You know, we can look for hours at these things, watch them move around, and we're fascinated by it. So we're constantly being surprised. Um, everything you said is true. Um, the surface can be different than the deep ocean. The warmer waters can be, deeper than, can be different than the cold waters. All of this is true, and we're studying all these things. Will we ever master it? Probably not. You know. <laughs> but it's still fascinating. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, how do you make sense of those spaghetti plots? <laughs> well, okay. I mean, there's... Uh, <laughs> there's yeah, give it, okay. Somebody said you give it to a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing, so, so what Jim showed uh, is one example of what people do with this. They'll, they'll take boxes, okay? The drifters go through the boxes, and what you can do is you can then average them. So one's going through at two knots, one's going through at five knots. You average all the ones that go through there, and then you say, okay, on average, the speed is about three knots. Okay, that's one, one way. And that's been a way that people have analyzed this data for many years. But there's lots of other things you can do with it, too. And this is, this is what we're still doing. We're still inventing new things that you can pick out. For example, how, like Tom was talking about, how floats he wants to design a float that has a constant depth over the bottom. It can hover over the bottom. But we know that when you put a float in, it tends to follow the bottom anyway. Okay? It tends to follow the isobath. So it's steered by that. So you can pick things out like this uh, and constantly be surprised. So um, there's lots of different things. What you have to do, it's this difference between this Euler, which is the, the Eulerian view, which is the picture of, the, of a weather, for instance, a weather model, which has all these grids and having things move around. And you have to change your thinking to, to go with that, to go with the flow. And, and see. Are there any models in the flow dynamics in the ocean as, say, the flow dynamics in the, our bodies and, the, you know, yeah. across the membrane or yeah. whatever? This is another great thing about this area because we're, most of us are oceanographers here too. But if you do this type of analysis, Okay, I'll be giving a talk on Thursday about balloons in the atmosphere. For us, it's just trajectories. And so if you have, uh, for example, if you can tag blood cells and look at how they're moving through the body, 
that's trajectories too. You use the same type of approach, same type of analysis for those things too. So the fun thing about this field is that it really goes uh, across disciplines. There's uh, all sorts of different areas. Uh, astrophysics, you can do all sorts of things where the motion of particles like that. So you can use the same type of things with all those. That's what makes it, one of the things that makes it fun. Okay. Okay, here comes the boss. So. <laughs> And you've anticipated me, and I was going to ask you to thank our four speakers tonight, but thank you all for being here tonight as well, and uh, the conversation certainly can continue as we uh, move out into the lobby, but thank you. This was a great pleasure and very interesting. Much appreciated.